It's me. Mm -hmm. It's me. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia. If you're a parent from East, you probably know me as mom. Um, I've been called that almost like exclusively by your children for the past seven months. So I apologize if I respond to the phrase when they're actually talking to you. <laughs> um, and I wasn't going to do the precursor, but precursor, I didn't want to be the millennial that like goes on a gap year and comes back and talks about feminism, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, so just letting you know that. Okay, so here we go. You just need to find a man that will support you. You're not going to want to work once you've had kids. These words were uttered to my multitasking, college stressing, overambitious self my junior year of high school. These words are probably the main reason why I'm standing in front of you at all today, and certainly the only reason that I've decided to discuss what feminism means to me and my POL. Those words marked the beginning of my attempt to navigate the modern dilemma of whether or not traditional gender roles are relevant in the 21st century, and whether or not I am open-minded enough to overcome some of my own learned biases. I'm not proud of the majority of my journey thus far, but I hope that by my talking about it, both you and I can learn and question more about what I'd become to accept were simple truths. You just need to find a man that will support you. I could have let these words go in one ear and out the other to find no significance in them whatsoever. I could have listened to them and thrown my ACT prep book into the nearest fire, body of water. But in a much more real way, I couldn't. I couldn't shake the fact that someone truly believed that all I had worked for was insignificant because no matter how driven I was, no matter how intelligent or passionate, the end result was always the same. I felt dismissed, inadequate, and incapable of controlling my own life. These words led me to the part I am not so proud of. Rather than becoming more understanding, more encouraging of men and women alike, I became angry. A popular catchphrase when asked why I was stressed during my junior year was that I was busy trying to abolish the patriarchy. <laughs> Sometimes it was said as a joke, other times I said things to this effect in a more serious manner. And do I think it was funny on occasion? I must have, I said it so many goddamn times. <laughs> and maybe it is funny when referring to Donald Trump, but the ideas that it reinforced in my mind, whether consciously or subconsciously, were not. In my mind, the patriarchy was a fancy way of saying all men. My lack of confidence and my ability to be an independent woman in the presence of a man intermingled with my predisposition for friendship and affection. My internal conf confusion manifested itself in ways externally that could be seen as manipulative or misleading, bordering on cruelty. It ran so deep that it changed the very essence of some of the personal relationships that I held most dear. At school, my attempt to single-handedly abolish the patriarchy resulted in me taking every chance I could to be my le a leader in my last years on campus. I edited every newspaper, responded to every captain call on the soccer field, toured prospective students, organized open houses, hosted or open houses, took all APs, and gave announcements and went to meetings for clubs I wasn't even a part of. To give you an indication as to how far this went, I was technically one of the leaders of the Young Voters Club, and I'm not yet registered to vote. <laughs> I was on campus from 7.30 in the morning until 11 at night. There was a lot of responsibility and little to no time to stop and think, and I liked that. And don't get me wrong, a large part of me did love what I was doing. These were all things I was passionate about, and I wanted to make the most of the time I had left at a school I loved. But another part of me had gotten caught up in the idea that in order to be relevant, in order to be better than what I'd been told a woman could be, I had to be the boss. I cared a great deal about what I was doing, but I cared far too much about what my title was. But all the late nights had been worth it. The moments I spent with my classmates and friends that last year on campus are memories that I'll cherish forever. And to top it off, I found myself blessed with far more college options than many could dream. The only problem being that I didn't want to go to any of them. <laughs> so at the end of it all, May 2nd came around, I put my deposit down, and you could find me crying behind sunglasses as I told a friend at the spring carnival where I was going to school. Everything felt like a trap. College was the next four years that would be followed by a short-lived career and then marriage and babies. I would never see the world like I wanted to, forget about business or law school or living in a city. None of it mattered because they were all means to the same end. My future was predetermined, out of my control. The fire that burned within me, that drive, those desires would soon be extinguished, engulfed by a sea of spit up and dirty diapers. So the reason I came on TVB, TVB was largely fear-driven. 
People said that it was brave of me to come on this trip, to forgo holidays at home, embrace the unknown. But the truth is that to me, the alternative was so much scarier. I'd resigned myself to the fact that there would one day, there would once come a day when I would turn in my two weeks notice that I would find myself unable or unwilling to leave my hypothetical children at home. Um, because what was the point in denying the inevitable? You could even say that I was okay with it, but hell if I wasn't gonna make the most of the time I had left on my own. That time that one I dreamed of soon came around. I flew out of the San Francisco International Airport on a red eye September 12th with a pack filled to the brim feeling as though I had mitigated all of my fears. I was going to see the world. There would be no more radicalized feminist statements for me. I was too busy forging my own path. I was pleasantly surprised to find out that many of the women on this trip had no desire for spouses or children, and I joined them in this thought process, temporarily sidelining my deep-seated love of babies in order to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm obsessed. <laughs> it's actually a problem. <laughs> I was clearly not convincing enough. I was dubbed mom within the first 48 hours of South Africa. <laughs> and since the topics of motherhood and womanhood were clearly not going away, I decided to embrace them by choosing to join the women group for our first media project. The project did not begin with that title, though. The Women Project began as the question, how does structural violence play into gender inequality in South Africa? <laughs> I know it sounds fancy, but there were a couple problems with this question. One, the idea that in one month we felt we could uncover the institutions <laughs> and attitudes that we believe perpetrated gender inequality in a country that we had been in for three weeks. And two, we assumed that the female population we would be interviewing felt as though they were oppressed. I'm sure that we could have interviewed, um, this, sorry, this is where I learned the importance of the questions you ask. I'm sure that we could have interviewed the same women that we did, asked them questions about gender inequality, and get answers that would have reinforced the assumptions in our initial question. But we didn't. We decided to ask them neutral questions. What do you do? What's the best and worst part of being a woman? What are your hopes and dreams, et cetera? What we found was that without any sort of coercion on our part, most of these women felt as though they were strong, beautiful, caring, hardworking, and the list goes on. That was the beauty of the project. The fact that these women had reminded us of the good when we had gone in ready to find the very worst. And I found that while I had tried to move away from some of the man-hating death to the patriarchy talk, I still held on to the idea that women were somehow inherently weaker than men. I felt that we had been wronged, that lies about what we could and couldn't do, that we are objects to which something had happened to. I had forgotten that we are people with strength, perseverance, and at least in South Africa, an inescapable sense of optimism. I left South Africa feeling as though I had leaving JFK, embarrassed of how naive I had been, and no longer susceptible to the follies of the past. And I know this seems like a good time to probably like end it, wrap it up, <laughs> do a quick Q&A. Um, but don't worry, we haven't talked about India yet. <laughs> hold, hold tight. I'm sure that everyone that has seen student or been or talked to a student or seen a POL knows that we went to India. It seems to be the country that many flock to when explaining what country was the most challenging and or the biggest learning experience. If you are sick of hearing this point of view by now, I regret to inform you that I am no different. This is because India was one of the first times in my life that I have felt scared. Not scared like when I watched Law and Order or when I had a calculus exam in high school. I was scared like clinging to the men in the group and nearly hyperventilating on the Delhi subway scared. I, like many people in the group, had my reasons. There were inappropriate touches, looks that lasted too long, comments and catcalls. I was deeply shaken and found myself angry once again. Any steps that had been made in South Africa towards forgiveness and greater understanding of how easy it is to generalize on, based on gender were forgotten. Anger and blame were now the name of the game. I was angry at the men who I believed thought their actions were justified because they were directed towards women. I was angry because I felt that the men in our group couldn't truly understand how the women in the group were feeling. Quite frankly, I was angry that they tried to understand. I did not need to be told by the kind, funny, intelligent, and respectful men of our group that not every guy was like that. In India, I saw them, along with my wonderful host father and uncles, as anomalies, exceptions to the rule. Men were guilty until proven innocent. 
I was unforgiving and failed to see the damage my assumptions caused, but I didn't want to hear it when the men of the group explained to us they felt their gender vilified. I wanted anger and I did not want any attention drawn away from the issue that I felt was the real issue. How we felt violated, silenced, and this room. And at this point in the presentation, you're probably expecting me to tell you what I actually think feminism is, give a nice concise definition to something to something I believe is ever-changing and in many ways inexplicable. You may think that my definition of feminism would include bra burning and man-hating, but it does not. I hope that this presentation has given some insight and anecdotal evidence to the damage that gender stereotypes can cause. And to answer your question in the most roundabout way possible, I would like to tell you a story. On TBB, in addition to some more traditional academic seminars, um, we have identity development seminars, which is essentially a way for students to explore different facets of their identity within the larger group. Um, in one of these seminars in India, the men and women each had a large sheet of paper. We listed words usually used to describe our gender and then discussed within the group how we felt we did and did not fit the descriptions written on the board. There are a million different descriptions written, but there are only two that I remember with clarity. Emotional and not emotional. Um, I'm sure that you can guess which words belong on which boards. Emotional found its home on the women's board, not emotional on the men's. Both the men and the women decided by a vote that they did not identify with the description written on their individual board and chose to cross it out. I was aghast at the decision made in my group, and quite frankly, I still am. The adjective emotional has such negative connotations that the majority of the females in our group had decided that they did not or did not want to identify with it. Meanwhile, the men resisted their non-emotional just as fervently. Have we created and played into a culture so twisted that we denied both men and women the ability to see the value in being emotional? This is where I find the importance of feminism becomes undeniable. And this is where you may think that if it is truly a movement of equal participation and equal importance to both genders, why don't we just call it egalitarianism? I once would have asked the same question myself, but something Julia Scott said changed my mind. When we discussed this very topic, she said that the reason she found it important to call it feminism was the fact that both genders have been denied the ability to express qualities once deemed as feminine in equal part. Emotionality is associated with the feminine, which for some time was a synonym for weakness. Personality traits have been divided into the feminine and the masculine, unyielding, even when the individuality of each person has long ago been acknowledged. I had been unable to hear and see this message above the constant honking and pollution of India. Even now, with the wide open spaces and clean air of Virginia and DC, I find it hard to include men in these kind of conversations. So the statement, you just need to find a man that will support you, is more true than I could have imagined it was at the time. I do need a man to support me, about 3.5 billion of them. <laughs> and do I know what the support looks like? No. I wish that I had any idea of what true gender equality looks like. I wish that I was able to end this POL definitively, tie a bow around it, leave you feeling odd, believing that I was a woman with a plan. The truth of the matter is that a big part of me did not want to share this with you today. I feel fraudulent talking about such big topics when I've experienced so little. I worry that this presentation would have to define my view of gender going forward. The truth is that I have little to no idea what my college or career path will look like or how my opinions will change. But if there's anything that I've learned from the past year is that my future is as ever changing as my definition of feminism. A year ago today, I was about to leave to tour colleges unaware of the existence of TVB. Five years ago, I was living in Maple Grove, Minnesota, unaware of the school that awaited me in California. There were uncontrolled variables that led to these actions, but ultimately, they were the choices I made. And this, I guess, is what I've been trying to get at this whole time. What I truly want is the freedom of choice. Motherhood and marriage are certainly not a condemnation, but I view them as such because they were presented to me as inevitable, something that would happen to me regardless of what I wanted or believed. I felt as though my being a woman would force me to be an inactive participant in my own life. I now know that this is so far from the truth. 
I will make a lot of choices in my life, some of them good, most of them probably bad. Um, but the point is that I will get to make them. And so in 20 years, you may find me in an office, preferably the oval-shaped one down the street, um, or living in the suburbs with a couple of kids. But the two things that I know with certainty is that I know absolutely nothing about what the future holds. And that has been one of the greatest pleasures of my life getting to be the mom of our wonderful little group. I am forever grateful. Thank you very much. any questions feel free to ask if not I'll feel free to take my seat so. <laughs> yeah what of your behaviors gave you mom what what of your behaviors I think it was Ellie that yeah. gave it to me because I was comforting her when she was upset I think it also just like, stuck because I tell everyone to put on their sunscreen all the time <laughs> pink answer is real good <laughs> um yeah I don't know Maybe I love babies too much. <laughs> I changed pretty much every cover photo on the computer to one of my baby cousin Layla. So. <laughs> I don't know what made it stick, but it did. <laughs> so, um, so I was really curious about all of the different types of learning experiences that, that were part of this path. This yeah. So what, what do you want the next set of learning experiences to be like? I mean, is it do you feel like there's an academic part of that? Do you feel like there's personal exploration? Do you feel like there are things you want to explore in the world and other people's experience with feminism? What are the particular things that you feel really drawn to in terms of this exploration? Yeah, I guess like the past learning experience, and I think what was really huge for me this year was the host mothers that I had. Um, and I really wanted to do a POL about them, and it just didn't shake out the right way. Um, but like, for example, my host mother in India, she cooked every single meal, she woke us up, she tucked us in at night, she loved us and cared for us and told us how it was, and during the day she went and she worked at like her shop where she tailored suits. Um, and so I think a lot of what I view as like learning about gender and like what it really means to be a woman in the 21st century happens just through witnessing other people. Um, and I think it was really evident with the men on this group as well as the women like all the women are super strong and opinionated and know what they want and are curious and questioning um and the men even though i was angry at them in india we're always just very open-minded and eager to learn um so i don't know if that answers your question but i guess just learning th more through the people I interact with. Um, I don't think that I'll be like a women and gender studies major, if that's more of the academic side of it. Um, but I just think that being surrounded by strong-minded, passionate people really makes a difference. Um, with your group, because it was so heavily oh, female, yeah. um, how did you find, I mean, strong women, all of you, the three guys, um, yeah. Did you find that, that you did have more discussions with them? I mean, to come around, like, to if you had issues with, say, how you all were maybe perceived in a country or even just in the group or something, yeah. did you find that you all could talk about it pretty openly with the guys? Like, were they receptive to when you all are all so different? Yeah. Um, were they kind of do you feel like you changed their way of thinking in any way or um i think it's just like there's an extra awareness i think that comes with being a woman of like women's issues um and i think in india I, I can only speak for myself it was just very emotionally charged all the time like i totally got that the men like couldn't quite understand like what it meant to walk through the street and feel unsafe because that just wasn't their experience um I don't know. They were always very receptive to it. I think once we kind of got out of that environment and we were in Thailand, it was much easier to have those discussions. Um, 
I think largely due to my part and just my opinion in the whole thing in India. Um, but they were always very receptive. And I think um, our experience in India led to a lot of good conversations and dialogue in Thailand, for sure. Mm -hmm. No one has any more questions? I'll call that a wrap. Thank you very much.